to the depths of the sea. Creations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings Christchurch. Uh, I thank you all for joining us, and uh, I'd like to invite anyone still out the floor to come and join us in worship this morning. Our call to worship this morning comes from 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How great 
the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory Wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me.
Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. So as we continue our series on true belonging and what that looks like in our homes and in our families, uh, I'd like to share this verse with you, if you would all read it with me. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as he is pure. I just wanted to take a moment and reflect back on Regardless of what our families look like at home, uh, regardless of whether or not we feel like we belong, um, God the Father in heaven gives us a place that we belong in Christ. He gives us a family that we belong to, and he's always there for us. So if you would just join us this morning in thanking and praising our Father in heaven. Stories of what they think 
your light, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, there's many searching for God, we just lift you up in praise this morning. We just thank you for being our Father, and we just thank you for the reminder that you will always be there waiting for us with a place that we truly belong. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Christ Church. My name is Herb. I'm an elder here, and uh, we're so glad you joined us today. Um, we are a strategic partner of Grace Chapel in Lexington, and we are on a mission to celebrate people, pursue wholeness, and discover God along the way. Um, if you are a visitor here today, we welcome you. Thanks for coming and making us a part of your Sunday morning. Um, there's a Connect card in the seat pocket in front of you. If you could fill that out and drop it off at the Welcome Center, we have a gift for you. And uh, you can write ways we can pray for you and things like that. It would be really great. Um, we have uh, this morning a special uh, parental dedication. So I'd like to call up uh, 
John, Pastor John and Amy and, uh, and Leah. Joy. <laughs> so the, the uh, birth of a child is a precious and amazing thing. And um, a gift that is not only for the family, but for our larger family as a spiritual family together. And um, we just want to celebrate these moments uh, every chance we get. So um, in Psalm 23, um, it tells us that children are a gift from God and blesses the man who has a quiver full. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. <laughs> Um, but with, with, with the responsibility of a child, um, you know, there, well, with, with the gift of a child, there comes tremendous responsibility. And uh, as a parent of, of three, um, I know it well. And um, God, God uh, urges us in um, a famous passage in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, um, called the Shema, which means to hear or to listen and um, it's one that we all know. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your soul. These commandments I give you today are, are, to, be, um, are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home. When you walk, walk or drive along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. John and Amy have come today before you all to acknowledge their responsibility as parents. They want to celebrate Leah Joy and commit themselves to raising to know God, her to know God and to live accordance with the gospel. John and Amy. Do you commit yourselves as Leah Joy's parents to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength through the power of the Spirit and a daily walk of faith? We do. Do you commit yourselves to sharing your faith with Leah in every kind of life circumstance? We do. 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 7 reminds us that each one of us has gifts from the Spirit given for the common good. As much as we desire to be perfect parents and to be able to provide everything that our children need to know God and to come to faith, we know that God has designed a much bigger family to be a part of Leah's life. And this church is part of that family. So Christ Church of Amherst, will you please stand with me? And if you consider this your church family, will you respond with we do after these following questions. CCA, do you commit yourselves to knowing Leah by name, to rejoicing over, with her over her milestones, and to speak encouragingly in Leah's life? Amen. Christ Church, do you commit to remaining open to different ways you might use your gifts to support Leah's faith and point her towards Jesus? Let's, uh, let's pray for this little one. Let's see if we can keep her from crying here. <laughs> Lord, we are just so grateful for Leah's life, for the joy that she brings her family, her parents, her grandparents, and for all of us. She is a gift from you, and we thank you for her life. We pray your blessing, your spirit to be richly upon her, and that she... Lord, would have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness and for you, that you would give wisdom to John and Amy to be the parents that, um, that Leah needs. And Lord, would you um, just give them the ability to make those difficult decisions along the path that will help Leah to grow to be a child that will bring you joy, not just now, but for her whole life. We commit her into your hands. We ask your blessing to be upon her. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And if we can just, uh, just celebrate Leah and our, our good Lord with a round of applause.
You may be seated. <clears throat> well, at CCA, we, uh, our mission is to, first part of our mission is to celebrate people. And, and we love to celebrate all kinds of people here at CCA. We like to celebrate uh, people who are this age and people who have yet to be born. We love to celebrate people who are elderly, who may be nearing the end of life. We love to celebrate people who struggle with disabilities. Uh, we, we, love to, we love to celebrate all people. Um, we think life is precious and, and we, we, want to, we want to cherish it. And one of the reasons we want to cherish it is because <laughs> we believe that all people are created and crafted in God's image whether that's the person that we see and we just walk by in the grocery store or whether that's uh, somebody that we work with or the people that we drive by and cut off in traffic sometimes. <laughs> All people are created in the image of God. And, and like I said, at CCA, we love to celebrate that because it's easy to forget the value and worth of every individual. And that's one of the reasons that we chose to make it such a focus here at Christ Church of Amherst. Um, uh, we do that... One of the ways that we really want to help people and celebrate people and families is we, we participate in safe families, and you'll be hearing about that later in the year. And we also have families who participate in foster care. But in January, we have a special focus uh, uh, that we like to support a, a ministry called uh, CareNet. And uh, they have a bottle drive. Maybe you saw some of these bottles as you walked in. CareNet is an organization that uh, brings hope and support to to women who have found themselves uh, with an unplanned pregnancy. So we, we wanna support those women because God loves them, they're, they're valuable, they're cherished. Uh, we want to support those babies that uh, are about to be born. We want to uh, do everything we can to cherish them, not only their lives, not only the, the fact of their lives, but the quality of their lives after. So one way that you can do that is by grabbing a bottle and uh, filling this with loose change, uh, cash maybe, or uh, possibly a check. She thinks a check would be nice. <laughs> and uh, returning one of the bottles in a couple of weeks uh, at the Welcome Center. So uh, we encourage you to do that as a way to celebrate people with us. Well, a couple more announcements at Christ Church. First of all, our we got our men's retreat coming up February 15th to the 17th. Uh, just got word on the theme of that. The theme is right along with our uh, True Belonging series, living life on purpose, creating intentional intention in relationships. So this will be a great opportunity for us to build a men's group of men here that truly belong to one another and are, are supporting one another. And um, we really encourage you guys to uh, look at that weekend, February 15th to the 17th, and see if you're available. It's always a great time up at Lake Winnipesaukee. Um, bring your snow boots along. So you can learn more about that at the Welcome Center. Um, last week we were off, right? So uh, it was a little nasty outside, and what an awesome resource it was to have the uh, video for those of you who were able to watch that at home, for those of you who couldn't make it in. Just a note, uh, we really... Uh, we value your safety. So uh, we have such a large geographical footprint we from Temple to Derry to Bow. Uh, people drive from a long distance. So those are always choices that uh, people have to make on an individual basis, whether we choose to have services or not. And we encourage you to do what's best and what's safest for your families in instances like that, even if we choose to have service for those that can those are, that are within a safer distance. But we'll always try to make sure that we send out notification by 8 a.m. on Sunday morning at the very latest. Uh, one of the features that we have been using is a text system, but unfortunately there's some hiccups in that text system, so we weren't able to get those, those texts out on Sunday morning. So we have a new text system, uh, and I, you know, we don't normally ask you to pull out your cell phones, but if you'd like to sign up for just emergency texts and service cancellations, I'd encourage you to go ahead and pop out your cell phones right now. Uh, we are not going to spam you. I don't even, we won't even be able to see which numbers are registered for the system. And you can just hit stop at any time. But if you text CCA safety, CCA safety to the number 84483, you'll be registered for those texts. And we can let you know about cancellations. We can also let you know if there's an emergency, emergency situation at the church. And we won't use that for advertising for events or anything. This is an emergency and cancellation-based system only. So 
Again, if you would take a moment and grab your cell phones and text CCA safety, one word, no spaces, caps uh, or lowercase, it doesn't matter, to 844 Eight, three. That's 84483. That'll give us an opportunity to let you know um, about any emergency situation that occurs here or, um, or a weather cancellation as, as well. Well, we're really excited about our new life group series coming up not next week, but the week after. Uh, there will be life groups meeting in Merrimack, in Amherst, and Milford as well. Many of you find yourself in a place in life where you're facing some spiritual challenges, whether this is the first whether you're in the early steps of your faith, the early steps of your faith journey, or whether you've uh, been a believer and have been following Christ for a long time, we all face the spiritual challenges. How do, we, how do we have a good attitude in the midst of trial and trials? What do we do with when conflict comes our way? How can we navigate our way through those difficult relationships that we sometimes find ourselves in? What do we do when we face bad counsel? There's, there's so many voices in the world. How do we determine bad counsel from good counsel? These are all questions that we're going to be asking, and we're going to have some really healthy discussions during these, these life group sessions. So we encourage you to sign up at the Welcome Center. We'll, we'll plug you into the best life group that fits you for the area and the time of the week. Um, these are going to be video life group series, so you'll be getting a link to the video ahead of time. You can also receive it in a podcast format so you can listen on your way to work in preparation. And we've also printed off some books uh, for Between Waves, charting a course through life's spiritual challenges there at the Welcome Center. And you can buy one of these for $5. So if you prefer a print format um, and you have some extra cash, then you can do that as well. So I encourage you to stop by. We're really excited about this Life Group series coming up. There are a lot of other things going on at Christ Church, and we encourage you to Uh, Check out our website or like us on Facebook to uh, hear about all the uh, other news and events that are coming up. So in just a moment, Pastor Brian will be continuing our series, True Belonging Home Edition. Chances are that there was probably a time in your life where you imagined what your family would look like. Maybe you imagined that you'd be, your kids would be surrounding the dinner table laughing, (laughs) telling you about your day and Uh, What a wonderful experience that would be. Or maybe you imagine staying late up into the night having these deep, deep conversations with your spouse. But the reality is (laughs) that we are really disconnected these days. It seems like we're more disconnected than we were in past past years. Your kids are rarely home for supper, maybe you find. Or you find your spouse, instead of having these deep conversations late at night, are texting or checking out social media on their phones Instead, how do, we, how do we obtain a balance where we can both respect the individual ways and, and things that God, God is doing in our kids and our, our spouses and our parents' lives? How can we respect that, but also strive for really healthy connections that are so vital for a, for a meaningful family? How do we achieve that true belonging that we all, that we all long for? Pastor Brian is going to address that question today. Good to be with you all today in person after our snowy Sunday last week. Uh, Along with many of you, Karen and I watched the service at home last Sunday. We actually had some friends over and we watched together. We even found ourselves singing along softly in our family room with Mike and Robert uh, as we worshiped together. 
Our guest speaker, Virginia Ward, brought a great message, and it was just a great experience. We, it looks like we had over 1,400 households tune in last Sunday, so that feels like a good, uh, a good day. So it's wonderful to have that option, but it's a whole lot better to be in the house together today, wherever you might be worshiping. So we're glad you're here with us. So how do we become the people that we are? Is it nature or nurture? Is who we are determined by innate factors like genetics and biology or by environmental factors like parenting and life experiences? It's a question we might ask of, about the children that we dedicated here in Lexington just, just a few moments ago. How much of who they become has already been programmed into them by their DNA, and how much of who they become will be shaped by their parents and by this faith family. It's a question that's been debated for a long time, all the way back as far as ancient Greece. Now, for many centuries, the debate focused on a kind of either-or proposition. Is it nature or nurture? And philosophers and scientists kind of lined up on one side or other of that question. Into the 20th century, the discussion shifted a little bit as uh, there was a meeting of the minds and the thinking was it was nurture and nature and nurture, that both innate forces and environmental factors kind of uh, are both influencing the growth and development of a person. Uh, for instance, uh, a, a child might come into the world with a genetic predisposition to be tall and big-boned. But if that child is malnourished and sedentary, he might never attain that optimum height and strength. So it seemed as though nature and nurture were kind of working in tandem, both of them influencing development. In more recent days, in this 21st century, the thinking now runs along the lines of nature with nurture. That innate forces and environmental factors not only work in tandem, but actually in sync with each other synergistically so that one fuels the other. Certain genes, it turns out, can be turned on or turned off by environmental factors. For instance, scientists tell us that, um, that perfect pitch is a genetic trait. The ability to uh, recognize and replicate a particular musical note. And if you don't have that trait, you know, and the person next to you probably knows that as well. <laughs> but that's a genetic trait. But if that trait is never turned on by musical experience or musical training, it might never manifest itself and might actually be lost. So nature and nurture are working together. That, that, that science is called epigenetics which means above and beyond genetics. Now, I, I bring all that up as we get started simply to help us uh, understand that we're going to discover a biblical truth today that's going to help us experience true belonging with the members of our family. Now, we're in week four of our series, True Belonging, Home Edition. And so far, these are the things that we've been learning. Our homes, we said, become places of true belonging when we value faithfulness, sticking with each other for the long haul, no matter what. When we value trust, placing our deepest needs and our highest longings in each other's hands. Restoration repairing relationships with God's help whenever possible. And if you didn't get to hear Virginia Ward's message last Sunday, I encourage you to go online and get it. Well, today we're going to add nurture to the list. So we'll talk about what that means, why it's important, and how we can actually offer it to the members of our family, whether we're living under the same roof right now or not. And, and since since we experience family in all different ways here in this congregation, I found it helpful in this series to invite people from different stages of life to come and share with me a little bit at the platform. So in a few minutes, a little later on, I'm going to invite Pastor Tim Galley to come and share a little more personally and practically along this line of nurture. Let's take a minute first to define nurture so we know what we're talking about, and then we'll dive into our scripture for the day. 
So I found two definitions helpful as I was preparing. The first is that nurture is to care for and encourage the growth and development of someone or something. So there's both a physical and a psychological aspect to nurture. It's to care for, but also to encourage. Another definition puts it this way, to feed, protect, and care for someone while they are growing and developing. Now, what I liked about this definition was the idea that when we nurture, we join in on something that's already happening. You see, it's the nature of a living thing to grow, whether it's a baby or a begonia. Living things grow. We can't make a thing grow, but we can help it grow. We can influence its growth. We can shape it as it grows. We can turn on what nature has wired in. That's nature and nurture working together. And it turns out that's how God designed things from the very beginning. This truth was revealed in the scripture long before anyone ever came up with the word epigenetics. So let's dive into the scripture for a little bit and see what we can learn here. Now, I'm going to read the whole passage. It's kind of a big picture of, uh, of, of family relationships. Then we'll come back and take a closer look at a few verses. This is from Ephesians chapter 5, a letter the Apostle Paul wrote to Christians in Ephesus. Chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, scholars tell us that this section we just read was a very familiar form or rubric in the ancient world. It was called a household code. We might think of it as a, as a mommy blog in the ancient world. This was collections of common wisdom on how to raise a family, how to have a happy home. And while the form may have been familiar to the original readers, the content of it was revolutionary. So let me show you why. It begins in verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, this verse is actually a bridge verse between the previous section, which talks about being filled with the Spirit, and the following section, which talks about household relationships. But before he gets to that, Paul wants to lay down this foundational principle that governs all relationships for Christian people. It's the principle of submission. Now, that word would have been as uncomfortable for Paul's original readers as it is for many of us today. Ancient Greeks and Romans were just as proud, just as independent, just as stubborn as 21st century Americans can be. To submit to someone is to put yourself under them. It's to put their needs, interests, and desires ahead of your own. Now, submission isn't subjugation. It's not subordination. It's not about inferior quality or lack of, lack of equality. And it's certainly not about control or domineering behavior. Submission is a voluntary decision 
to let someone else go first, to put them in front of you. And that's not such an easy thing for human beings to do. Now, I was actually thinking about this as I was driving on 128 the other day, <laughs> and I was trying to merge into another lane, and suddenly the idea of letting other people go first wasn't what I wanted to do. <laughs> it doesn't come easily to most of us. And that's what makes this so revolutionary. It goes against the grain. Now, when Paul says, submit to one another, he's speaking primarily about the body of Christ, the Christian family. But he's going to go on to tell us that this principle of submission should govern our family relationships as well. And if it's hard to let others go first on the highway, it can be just as hard to let others go first at home. Submission at home might involve simple things like who gets to choose what show to watch, or who cleans up the dishes, or who gets up with the baby. But it can also involve bigger things, like who puts who through school, whose career do we follow, who gets to go away for the weekend with their friends. Submission doesn't come easy. But we do it, Paul says, out of reverence for Christ. Out of reverence for Christ. Now I got thinking about that phrase and kind of turning it over in my head a little bit. And, and, and I came to understand or to recognize it's not just to, we do it because Christ is watching. We do it because of who Christ is. Because of what Christ has done for us. Because of what Christ is doing in us and in the lives of the people that we love. Remember, this sentence here is part of a much larger letter. And we have to understand this sentence in light of the whole letter. And the whole letter is about what life is like in Christ, with Christ, having a relationship with Christ. So let me back up a little bit to a key verse in this letter that's going to help us understand this. I want to go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Paul's reminding us that God's design for our lives goes all the way back to creation. It goes all the way back to our conception, the moment in which our DNA was being formed. This is why the, the lives of, of unborn children are so important to so many of us. Because we believe that God is at work forming and shaping us from the very beginning. Every human being is made to reflect the image of God, to glorify Him in a unique way. That destiny is hardwired into us as human beings. It's part of our nature to be like God. Whether we're believers or not, it's part of our nature. The, the genetic stuff is there. And when we invite Christ into our lives, that, that image-bearing capacity gets flipped on. And we now begin to become the people God meant us to be. And Christ begins forming us and nurturing us into his image. And the Holy Spirit begins nurturing that work as well. And what we discover in Ephesians chapter 5 is that one of the ways Christ nurtures that image in us is by placing us in families, a spiritual family called the church, and our earthly family as well. Have you ever looked around at the members of your family or your family tree and said, how did I end up here <laughs> with all of these people? <laughs> what we're learning here is that God places us in families on purpose so that we might be help, help them and they might help us become the people we were designed to be. Our homes are to be places of nurture. There are all kinds of ways for us to nurture life in each other, but all of them involve some degree of submission, putting someone else's needs, interests, and desires ahead of our own. And so in this next section, in this household code, 
Paul's going to help us understand what that looks like very, very practically. And the first relationship he talks about is the relationship between husbands and wives. Now, this isn't a sermon about marriage, so there's a whole lot here we are not going to talk about. We've talked about it other times. I simply want to drill down on this idea of submission because it turns out this guides all of our relationships and our earthly families and our spiritual family. So let's jump down to verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Now, Paul's drawing on the imagery here of a wedding ceremony, and he's picturing the church as the bride of Christ. Now, every bride wants to look her very best on her wedding day, right? And she and her family will go to great lengths and to great expense to make that happen. I know because I paid for one of those. (laughs) Every bride wants to be her most beautiful self. And not just her most beautiful self, but her most radiant self, to borrow Paul's word. Because it's not just about physical appearance, about the dress and the makeup and the accessories. It's about the inner beauty being put on display for everyone to see. A bride wants to be her very best self on her wedding day. And Christ wants that very same thing for every one of his children, that we might be our very best selves. And he is so committed to seeing that happen that he'll spare no expense, that in fact he will lay his life down. Jesus put our interests, needs, and desires so far ahead of his own that he suffered and died for us so that we wouldn't have to, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be free. And out of reverence for that, Paul says, we also lay down our lives for each other, putting our loved ones first, beginning with husbands and wives. Now, I was thinking about this the other day, too, as I was on the exercise bike, just turning this verse over and over in my mind a little bit. As I got to thinking about what it means to put someone else first, I I was asking myself how, how often, how consistently I had put Karen's needs, interests, and desires ahead of my own. As I thought about that, I got convicted about how often I had not done that, how often I had put my things ahead of her things. And then I got to thinking about how often she put my things ahead of her things. And I began to realize how much of who I am today and what I've been able to enjoy and accomplish in life has been made possible by her sacrificial love for me. And then I realized how fast I was pedaling that bike. (laughs) I mean, there's nothing like the conviction of the spirit to push you into the red zone on your workout. I was pumping. But seriously, as a wife, as a mother, as a grandmother, Karen has consistently nurtured in me and in us all that God has placed within us so that we might become the people we were meant to be. And that involves sacrifice. There are all kinds of practical ways that that shows up, ways to nurture someone. Paul talks in the passage about care and feeding. There's certainly a very practical aspect to nurture. It's, it's putting food on the table. It's putting a roof over their heads. It's putting clothes on their back. It's providing for their education. It's giving them life experiences, all kinds of things. But they almost always involve a certain amount of sacrifice. I actually saw a sign as I was leaving the gym that day that said, what you feed grows. 
what you feed grows. If you feed your child's technology habit, it will grow. If you feed your child's love for music or sports or reading, it will grow. If you feed your child's faith, it will grow. That's nurture. Ultimately, nurturing means doing whatever it takes to help another person become the person God designed them to be. Even when it means laying down your own personal needs and pursuits and dreams. Well, in the next few verses, Paul's going to go on to talk about parents and children and what nurture looks like there. Chapter 6, verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. I want to speak for a minute to every child or teenager in the house today or wherever you happen to be watching online, whatever house you're in today, every kid, every teenager. God has placed your parents in your life to help you become your very best self. It may not always feel that way, and they won't always get it right. But generally speaking, when you obey your parents, when you follow their guidance, you are on your way to becoming a better you and to enjoy a happy and long life. God promises that. Let me speak for a minute to adult children, sons and daughters with parents who are perhaps in midlife or older years. When we honor our parents, when we include them in our lives and in our communication, when we ask for their advice, when we support them in some of the decisions and transitions that they're making, they and we are becoming more and more like Christ. That's how nurture nurture works between parents and children. In verse 4, Paul says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, Paul certainly had mothers in mind as well, but he seems to be confronting a father's tendency to exasperate his children, maybe by being too hard on them or being too easy on them or or being too detached from them. He's challenging fathers to, to, to be there for them, to be with them and for them. But mothers and fathers, remember, God is already at work in your children's lives. He has already designed them to do good and glorious things in the world. You don't have to make that happen. You just have to help it happen. You just have to nurture what God has already built in to turn on what God has wired in. There's something very liberating about that. Now, I realize there's a sin nature as well, and kids won't always do the things they were wired to do, but that's what discipline is for. But it sure helps to know they've they've been wired for goodness and for glory. And this is not just for husbands and wives and parents and children. This is for grandparents. This is for adult brothers and sisters and younger brothers and sisters. This is for your nieces and nephews. This is for everyone you call family. How can you help them become who God made them to be? And it's not just for your earthly family. It's for the spiritual family as well. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're called to nurture each other. We're called to be faith parents to the children and young people in our midst. This weekend, we have dozens of adult volunteers who are spending the weekend with our middle and high schoolers, giving up their own weekend, giving up a couple good nights sleep to help those young people have an experience with God. That's nurture. Well, you get the idea, I hope. Our homes become places of true belonging when we value nurture, doing whatever it takes 
to help the members of our family become the people God designed them to be. And that almost always means putting their needs, interests, and desires ahead of our own. Well, as I said, I thought it would be helpful for you to hear from someone at a different stage of life than I am in. So I'm going to ask uh, Tim to come on up and share a little bit more personally and practically what nurturing looks like in his household. Can we welcome Tim as he comes? Well, I didn't know how irrational I could be until I became a father. You know, I used to be such a normal guy until then. And one of the moments that started cluing me in was uh, years ago when Susan and I were packing up for a road trip uh, to go down and visit our friends down at the Jersey Shore. We had two little boys at the time, and we had also like a Toyota RAV4 that we were trying to pack with everything that we might possibly need just for a weekend. And we worried that we didn't have enough packed in there. And there's this moment that I have on the Garden State Parkway as we're driving south to the shore, and a different type of vehicle sped by me. And I remember looking at it for a really long time. It was the same type of look that I used to give, like, like at a Ferrari or a Lamborghini that was driving by. But this time, this was a, a minivan? <laughs> oh, we could fit so much more stuff in something like that. I sped up to it to see what it was. Like, I think that's the Honda Odyssey. Oh, that is sweet. No, 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 that's the, that's the Chrysler Town and Country. And the commercial started coming back to me, like, that's the one with stone go seating. I'm like, honey, look up the consumer reports. we got to learn about minivans. And that's when I knew something was changing very much inside of me. That was a, a pretty big stamp in the I'm a dad card. <laughs> Fatherhood has indeed changed me. And as Pastor Brian and I were working on this message, uh, he had brought up the topic of mutual submission as, as he shared. And, and my mind went to this moment uh, that, that, that my wife Susan and I had together. Uh, for, for those who don't know our story and for the sake of a brief recap, uh, we didn't have children for the first eight years of our marriage. We struggled with infertility, we had a miscarriage, and Susan came to the conclusion that, that we should pursue adoption. And I wasn't there yet. I, I, I had uh, a stubborn idea of, of what that was going to mean for us. Susan wisely did not try to argue me into her conclusion, and she gave me some space and some time to, to think about it, but she did not give up on that dream. And, and through this idea of mutual submission to one another, where, where you desire to, to please the other, I eventually reached that same conclusion that she was already at and where the Lord was bringing us both to. And I'm humbled by this for a number of reasons, but, but one is the timing. By the time we finished the home study, just a short while after that, a young mother called us on the phone and said, I'm going to have a baby born in three weeks. Would you adopt this child? And we almost missed out on that. And I'm so grateful that we didn't. And, and now with one adopted child and three biological children later, we have, we have four kids now, all under the age of 10 and under. Uh, I am so grateful for this. This, is how, this picture was taken on Father's Day. But when I hear the word nurture, I hear all sorts of things like the need to provide food and shelter and, and toys and safe transport. Those are all good things. But my wife and I, we want to be really good nurturers. So we want to provide clean and healthy food and, and fill our home with, with, with really great learning and, uh, environments and mind-stimulating things and, and have the perfect vehicle that will, will, will transport our ensemble of strollers and pack-and-plays and diaper bags and a mobile Costco section of snacks. <laughs> and this is where that irrationality sometimes comes back in and is brought on by fear. In my time with you, I want to encourage you to, to check our motives to see if we are nurturing more out of fear or nurturing more out of faith. I mean, often nurture gives way to fear, and our response is to give this exaggerated expression of provision. I mean, it starts off coming from a good place, but it easily mutates. Parents carry a lot of different thoughts and anxieties and questions and hopes, and, and, and many of us who, who are fortunate to come from from homes filled with wise parents, we wonder what our parents would have done in such a situation. I'm not as wise as they are. Am I going to get this right? And we, we toggle between the trivial thoughts and the complicated 
awful thoughts very quickly. From the trivial, we wonder, what if that appointment goes too long and, and, and it interrupts the, the schedule and the sleep schedule and the nap schedule and we run out of snacks and that's going to ruin the night, that's going to ruin tomorrow, that's going to ruin everything it feels like. And then the real nightmares. What if something terrible happens? I don't know how I would handle it. Safety and violence and health and illness and community and loneliness and hope and despair. And what if some of these terrible pains that we go through, what if they were preventable? I mean, it gets critically serious for us all here. Because we know people who have gone through terrible, terrible things that we cannot imagine bearing ourselves And chances are many of us have been through terrible, heartbreaking things, and we have vowed to do everything that we possibly can to not go back there anymore. Our hearts may be in the right place, but there is no such thing as nurturing our families in a way that we'll be free of pain, free of suffering, and exclusively only experience success and fun and safety. And this is why nurturing out of a motivation of faith is absolutely essential. It not only brings balance to the complicated realities of our world, but it also brings hope and joy and love into our home. And these are the people that we love more than life itself. In addition to these worst case scenarios, our minds are also filled by the challenges of modern day parenting. We wonder all the time, what what habits are we nurturing? Well, I wonder, am I, am I being too hard on this child? Am I being too lenient on this one? Am I, am I stifling this little one's personality? Or, or am I helping to uncover a, a bad habit that's going to allow this young person then to then flourish? And what about technology? Susan and I discuss often, are we nurturing kids whose minds are so dependent on technology that they can't daydream anymore? Or, or they're not able to eat without a cartoon character in front of them. And, and we, we want them to use technology as a great tool, but we don't want them to be enslaved by it. And so we find ourselves taking two steps forward and a couple steps back and, and, and meandering and wandering all around. We've come to a, a few conclusions, though. Uh, we, we don't allow screens in bedrooms. Uh, we do our best not to have any screens on the dinner table. And as, as typical for us, our, our youngest always gets away with a lot more than the older children do. So the phrase, it's not fair, is often heard um, in our home. Er, er, earlier this year, our 10-year-old needed a phone, and we, we, we took that into a deep consideration of what kind of phone that we should get. Uh, we decided to get an uncool phone, a flip phone. <laughs> and it is one of the best decisions that we've made. Uh, we want him to, to learn how to steward technology, and as he does that, he'll get a more advanced phone, and he's doing great. He calls at the exact times that he's supposed to call me, and he sends the appropriate text message when he should. He picks up when I call. His grades are absolutely fantastic. He's on his way to a BlackBerry as we speak. <laughs> one, one last thing as, as we talk about technology that has really helped our, our, our family Uh, We don't turn on the DVD player or allow screens on in the car. Uh, That's reserved specifically for long road trips. And and kids complain about this, and we have borrowed the page uh, and the script from all great parents. So when they complain, we say, when I was your age, (laughs) and that's what the great parents do. And we say, we used to make shapes in the clouds, and I would pretend I was riding my bicycle alongside the the, the station wagon and doing all these cool jumps and flips in the air. And inevitably, kids, because kids are kids, they say, that is so lame. That's, That's so not cool. You're talking to a guy that would rather drive a Chrysler Town & Country than a Lamborghini. Cool is not on my mind. One resource that we have mentioned uh, throughout the past year is The TechWise Family by Andy Crouch. And recently, they, him and the Barner Group just put out this new, free new resource called uh, The 21-Day TechWise Challenge, and I invite you to check it out. But I want to finish with, with expressing what, what Susan and I ultimately want for our children. I often think of Jesus' words in Mark 8 when he says, What does it profit you to gain the whole world but lose your soul? 
And we want to nurture physically and emotionally and spiritually in such a way that they have healthy, Christ-filled souls in the midst of this complicated world. And our kids have, have young kid dreams. One wants to be a baseball player or a soccer player and recently said, if I don't get signed by a professional soccer team, then I want to be a scientist. <laughs> One wants to design Lego sets and be a cartoon book, a, a comic book illustrator and, and, and so many other wonderful aspirations that they have. And like good parents, we want them to be successful. We want them to be good readers and, and curious learners, whether they go to a traditional college or, or pursue the right type of training for whatever their career or vocation is. And candidly, I would love it if one or two of them decided to enter into the ministry. But I am praying that the Lord would give me the strength to resist the temptation to nag them or to exasperate them. I'm praying that the Lord gives me strength to have a, a, a heart of mutual surrender for my wife and mutual submission for my children so that they might be able to identify and discover their identity in Jesus, their true calling, and their mission in God. I can feel Jesus almost saying to me, what good is it to please your parents and still lose your soul? We want them to be successful and not soulless. And we can't control them. We have to nurture. And we can't nurture out of fear. We must nurture out of faith. And so, friends, may you be blessed with wisdom and strength as you provide that nurture, care, and love to the people that you love. Amen. Well, thank you, Tim. I I really appreciated that distinction between parenting out of faith versus fear. That's very much what this nature-nurture thing helps us with. Because when as parents we realize that God has already designed our children to do good and glorious things in this world, when we realize that Christ is already working in their hearts, when we realize that there are faith brothers and sisters and parents also speaking into their lives, it takes some of the pressure off of us. We realize we can't make our children to be musicians or athletes or scholars or even Christians. We don't have the power to do that. What we can do is nurture what God has already built into them. We can be there for them and with them to help them become the good and glorious people that God made them to be. And the wonderful thing about this epigenetics, scientists tell us, is that it's a lifelong dynamic. It's never too late for some genetic switch to be flipped on in a person's life. It's never too late for you to help one of your family members take their next step to becoming the person they were meant to be. And it's never too late for you to invite Christ into your life. Because until you do, you can never fully become the person that you were meant to be, your very best self. And the wonderful thing about being part of a spiritual family is that even when our earthly family fails us, we have brothers and sisters in Christ, we have mothers and fathers in the faith who are ready to do whatever it takes, laying down a weekend or their lives in order that we might become the people God made us to be. This is a profound mystery, Paul says. But when we talk about family, we're talking about Christ and the church. Let's pray about that. Lord, as varied and unpredictable as families can be, we are grateful for the way you have designed us. We are grateful for people who have loved us and nurtured us along the way, whether in earthly or spiritual families. I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you might help each of us today to know the step you would have us to take. Maybe there's someone we need to reach out to this week in love. Maybe there's some family member that needs our presence in their lives. Maybe there's some dream or need or interest we need to lay down 
in preference for someone that we love. Or maybe we need to surrender to you and allow you to begin doing something new in our lives. Help us to do that today, Lord, and thank you for the people you've placed around us today who can help us on that journey. In Jesus' name, amen. Refuge for the poor, shelter from the storm. This is our God. He will wipe away your tears and turn your wasted years. This is our God. So call upon His name. He is mighty to save, this is our God. A father to the orphan, a healer to the broken, this is our God. He brings peace to our madness. Comfort in our sadness, this is our God. So call upon His name, He is mighty to save, this is our God. This is the one we are waiting for. This is the one we are waiting for. This is the one we are waiting for. Jesus, Lord and Savior. This is our.
This is our God. as we go ahead and close our service today, we want to invite you to uh, join us for refreshments out in, the, out in the foyer. We'd love to have an opportunity to pray for you if there's anything on your heart. And we also want to invite you to give. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. So you can do that through the offering box at the back or online at ccnh.org. If you don't water a plant, if you don't feed a fish, it dies. I can tell you from personal experience <laughs> and the same, same principle applies with our families. If we don't feed them, if we, if we don't make sacrifices for them, there is something inside of our families that die. But the good news is that we have a second chance, and then a second chance, and then a second chance after that. So as, as we depart, as we go our own separate ways today, I want to I wanna just leave you with a question. What are some ways that you, what are some areas where you can give something up for somebody in your family to help them along the way? And when you ask that, and when you find that answer, just watch. Watch and see God make them grow. Have a great week. Uh, may the God of peace and love energize you to celebrate people, pursue wholeness, and may he reveal himself so you can discover him along the way.